servicing homes whenever you add a recession-proof insurance element to it. Hurricane Inn dropped like $30 billion here. You know, they talk about global warming, but the storms just damage more property. Mm. So it's it's like reoccurring revenue. My grandpa told me there's three great equalizers of great men, drugs and alcohol, abuse and greed of money, like dealing from people taking money that's not yours, being a piece of shit, being addicted to sex and just willing to fuck up relationships just because there's something better right in front of your face. The day before I got the opportunity to close Green, I lost the biggest contract in my life. There was no reason for me to get it canceled. And I thought, woe is me, feeling victim, victim, victim. And then this opportunity comes right through the pipeline. You have to believe that when the door is closed on you, you're just that much closer to your big championship moment. Our guest today is one of the big heavy hitters in the local area, Lee Hates. Uh, I'm heavy hitter in multiple ways, actually. Super successful roofing, solar company, and also a heavy hitter with his fists and his uh, BJJ skills. So please welcome Lee Hates to the podcast. What's up, man? Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming. We've been trying for a while, actually. Yeah, It, was, um, it turned out pretty well, like Alexis... He, we were chatting yesterday and he's just like, do you need a guest? I was like, yeah. He goes, Lee? I'm like, oh yeah, we've been meaning to do that. So. Yeah, man. Well, I'm glad to get here, dude. Yeah. It's, and been, it's been busy with the hurricane and so that's been like absolute like all hands on deck. Hurricane. Yeah. Well, yeah. Were you here for the storm? I live off, uh, like literally on Bonita Beach. Oh, so. One bit back. We had 15 feet of water come through. Oh, that's kind of intense. Yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't there. Like I got the fuck out. I like, <laughs> put everything up. I wasn't... <sighs> There's a lot of people that were sort of like the proud Floridian kicked in. Yeah. And they were like, you know, oh, we're not pussies. We're going to stay. Yeah. And I, it breaks my heart that I it's, think it's a lot like of the, It's got, like the Dave Chappelle skit when keeping it real goes wrong. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's so sad. A lot of those poor older people, man, they, they drowned. Yeah. I think uh, uh, ego killed a lot of people, unfortunately, with this round mm -hmm. of hurricanes. But um, your... Actually, just we'll, just before we we started the podcast, you were chatting about a thing you've got coming up, and I yeah, want to talk about event, that quickly. Local that event, sounds fun. It's a blue collar American dream conference. It's like the fifth one we've done. This time it's going to be over a thousand people. It's for regular entrepreneurs, anybody that wants to uh, kind of fight back against the oppressive white collar machine. You know? mm. They're telling us how to think. The banks are failing. It's crazy. We all need more money for real estate. But uh, I'm in this like uh, blue collar niche, the home service industry, and yeah. Kind of like my whole life's purpose, I kind of like grew up in the industry is to make my business cool because when they started taking shop classes out of high school, nobody uh, wanted to actually go out there and work with their hands. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, working with the, my hands for me is not necessarily working with a hammer. It may be like knocking on doors or selling jobs, but... Mm. Um, you know, the blue collar American dream is just about like there's a gold rush service in America's homes. Think about it here in Naples. How many blue collar millionaires are made just like building the rich people's homes and servicing them? Yeah. Yeah. It's like Alex Mosey says, which is if you want uh, if you want to make money, solve rich people problems. Yes. You know? Yes. And it's like uh, Kanye West says, uh, Kim Kardashian may live in a twenty two million dollar house, but she's still got time for home improvement. So <laughs> that's how you know. Yeah. It's good to be in high ticket home improvement. A hundred percent. And um, so we uh, speaking about home loans, just because this literally came up yesterday. Uh, did you hear about the Biden thing? Like I try and be as middle as I can, but this thing really pissed me off. Mm -hmm. So they as of May 1st, they're introducing, uh, this thing to fight high risk mortgages, which is if you have a credit score of 640 and above, you're going to pay an additional $40 a month per, like on average of a $400,000 home loan. Oh, great. But yeah. uh, they've been printing free money and giving it to the banks, bailing out banks since 2009. So yeah. the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, and the middle class gets eliminated. Yeah. Isn't it funny how, like, it, this is where it doesn't make sense to me, is if you, like, if that whole thing collapsed anyway, mm -hmm. they get bailed out. So why do we have to pay them to but, avoid being and you, bailed out you anyway. You make a really good point because we don't make the rules. We play by their rules. And if you want to know who their rules are, they're the guys who made the education system, the Carnegie's, the Rothschilds. They're behind the Federal Reserve Bank. They're the guys printing money. And, mm. 
you know, there's this thing called quantitative easing. You know what it is? I've heard about it, but run me through it again. Well, basically, I uh, read a book recently called The Lords of Money, and it basically says that in 2009, to fight recession, they started to literally print money and give it to these investment banks better than 0% interest. They actually, what's better than 0% interest? Mm. They paid you to give you a fuckload of money. Yeah. And they did it by exchanging um, government bonds. But the reality is, is that it gave banks the ability to make risky investments. Mm -hmm. Where do you think those banks put those risky investments? Where? Well, I mean, a lot of (laughs) those risky investments went into tech stocks as we Mm -hmm. looked at, you know, the net worth of Jeff Bezos and all these guys. Of course, now they're not the richest people in the in the world. Do you yeah. know who, who the richest guy in the world is? I think we don't even know. It's probably like a bunch of what oil well, dudes. Oh, oh, well, the well, the, uh, the the Forbes list guy is the, is the Louis Vuitton guy. The guy that I heard that recently. Yeah, um, but but the, that one I always challenge though because he might be rich monetarily wise, but in terms of I think power. People like Bezos, Zuckerberg, and all those guys who have information and the and are able to control information are probably more. They're powerful definitely than that more guy. powerful. They have the world's smartest computers. Those are the yeah. machines. And like at our conference, there's this theme. It's like white collar versus blue collar, or the white collar American dream versus the blue collar one. You know, mm. go to college, uh, get a good uh, score at school. You know, and work for a good corporate company. You know, yeah. come out in debt. Maybe work your way up the chain of command and and someday somehow you'll be an important player and make a lot of money. I think that's a lie for a lot of people. I think people are finding themselves not able to get rewarded by that corporation, not able to find that corporate job. They, they can't find that meaningful, impactful thing. And in this world where there's all this information, all this education, going $180,000 into debt mm. just to be able to enter the workforce, it doesn't make sense to a lot of people. Yeah. Versus the blue collar American dream, which could be like, go out there, even if you start at the bottom, work with your hands on a roof, but then learn how to sell the roof, learn how the insurance claims process, master it, scale it. And you know what? Wes Watson, one of the guys who's speaking at my event, he's like, what no, would Wes you, is a crack up. I know. What <laughs> would you do? That what guy. would you do if you had to start over, Wes? And he's like, I would create content and sell a service. And that's actually what my book is about, Contracting Growth Secrets, how to use content, social media to scale any contracting company. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it was during COVID that we really, like, blew up because our digital door knocking strategies were, like, something that really only – the only way that a lot of people could, could operate. Yeah. And um, What's digital door knocking? Well, it's just, like, whenever you can geo-target a neighborhood where you're mm-hmm. doing home service projects and you can send in video content that builds no like, and trust, that educates, uh, ed- educates, entertains, and executes. I mean, the idea is that you can build a brand, you can create leads, and that you can, it's almost like sell in your sleep and knock on people's door on their phones. Yeah. And yep. uh, so that's what I try to switch because a lot of the guys depend on word of mouth and door to door. And so yep. uh, it's kind of like combining the old school and the new school to uh, not get wiped out by, you know, the white collar machines. That's what, yeah. uh, you know, uh, but you got to put the machines to work for yourself. Yeah. It, and a lot of people get confused. They think that it's one or the other. Mm-hmm. It's meant to be both, mm-hmm. you know, like, um, cause obviously I do content as well. So it's right up the alley of what I do. And it's like, but what happens is when I leave, say, meeting somebody, I want to create those touch points faster. And I've got two choices. Either I meet up with them for seven, eight, nine, 10, 20 coffees, mm-hmm. or I'm in their pocket on their phone a couple of more times. And then they're like, you know, I probably should reach out to this guy. Yeah. Or, there's know. a whole element of like engaging on social media, uh, commenting on people's posts, being involved in their life, and then, you know, finding a way in which you can add value to them and then getting to do business with them. Yeah. So let's talk about the easy challenge. You guys probably are not aware, but I used to be a personal trainer back in Australia for about eight years. After seeing so many clients stop training with me or stop those habits, they would just fall straight back into the things that made them gain weight almost instantly again. And so after a bunch of years, I realized it was, it hurt me a lot more than I think it hurt them because I just saw so much hard work go to waste. And so a couple of years into it, I started figuring out 
this new method that I call the one-two compound method. And so with that, it's about habit stacking, creating habits that will help you for years and years to come. And the best thing is it's so easy. So we've already had people lose up to 20 pounds in their first month by using the one-two compound method. Best part is they don't even realize that anything is happening because it doesn't have to be this hard work. It doesn't have to be all of a sudden your life is flipping itself over upside down and you have to focus on 20 different things. Instead, you're gonna have a one-on-one coach who will guide you every single step of the way so that you don't have to think. All you gotta do is just do the next thing, tick that off for 30 days and the next thing. And after time, what you will notice is the weight will just start coming off. Now, this is not just for people who are trying to lose weight, also people trying to tone or just change some habits so that they don't ever feel like they're being miserable through a diet. Because let's face it, diets do not work. So to find out more about the easy challenge and the one-two compound method, all you've got to do is head to my Instagram at Aussie Blake Doyle. Now that is O. Z, or Z, you guys call it Z, don't you? You call it Z? All right, O-Z, Blake Doyle, and then slide in my DMs and just write easy. Now let's go back to the show. Just yesterday, I had a guy on my podcast, and by the end of the podcast, he's like, let's roll, let's do this. Mm-hmm. Does that ever work for you, the podcast close? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't try and close on, because I feel like that's a little bit weird. It is weird. <laughs> but it's like it's definitely the, the it's what I've said to a lot of people too. I'm like, I mean, I moved here two years ago. Mm-hmm. From America, from Australia, no nobody, and I was I was doing I you know I'll go meet people, do and I was like, dude, this is taking me like twenty minutes to go drive to them if I'm lucky in Southwest Florida. Then I'm having a conversation, then I drive back. So it's like I'm setting aside two three hours of a day to have one interaction. And so the first client I got, all that money went one hundred percent into buying some equipment to turn. I was like, I may as well turn these conversations into content. And from that, it was like, all right, I have my face-to-faces, but now it's like I use those face-to-faces to market myself to 100, 200, 300 more local faces. I think that's the secret in today's world, trying to get two and three uses out of one action. Yes. And if you're not doing that in your business, it doesn't matter what business you're in, you're going to get wiped out in the times. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's cool too because, I mean, the, at least with you, it's like people understand what you do. With me, it was kind of like this weird paradox because mm-hmm. they're like oh so you're the podcast guy i'm like yes but i do content and they're like well i don't really get it i'm like you know how you found me i do the same thing for you <laughs> isn't it funny what's, it's what, very confusing what's for him. <laughs> a lot of i don't know who it was but it's like dude in the future as opposed to everyone being on social media everyone's gonna have their own podcast it's like yes instead yeah. of just like having your own facebook it's gonna be like understood that you got to share and bear these parts of your personality, what you do, and, and people want to connect on these different levels and have like an outside seat into the conversation of all your whole life. It's going to be like expected. Yeah. I mean, it's already getting to a point. I mean, what do you think about a business that's trying to be a new age business that's not having a conversation and recording it? Exactly. Well, and also the thing is too, people don't realize – It's not like, I think because they see the end product, Mm -hmm. just like any business, they see the end product and then it's, all right, that 30 second video. So you probably didn't spend too much time. It's like that 30, even outside, like when you pure curated stuff, that one video probably took a total man hours of two and a half hours, three hours, because it's like the planning for the shooting and then the planning and then the editing is like, it's still a solid, the editing can be an hour, two hours sometimes. Some, like the intro for some of our clips for our podcast, sorry, can be like four hours if I go two balls to the wall. Nice. And that's 30 seconds. You know? but the cool thing about <laughs> it is, is it's like just karma. It's like, then you get rewarded. You know, you, mm. you've had some big, you know, big videos, you know? And yeah. You don't know when they're going to come, but you, you put a lot of uh, work into being a master of something. And then I think that's what the problem with the world is people have such short attention spans that they don't actually want to master stuff. And they mm. put out half-ass product wanting badass result. And there's more competition in the world today. Yeah, You got to be better, not more average and diluted. Yeah, And so I don't know. I think uh, basically if people would be more willing to just follow someone else's plan from time to time and duplicate the success of others than make it their own, mm-hmm. then they get off a of square one. But they're so worried about being fucking unique and doing yeah. it their own way. And I mean, we're all unique, but we're all the same at the same time. Yeah, it's the classic thing like how the Beatles became famous. Mm-hmm. They got extremely good for multiple years by covering everyone's songs mm-hmm. and why, by them covering a thousand, two thousand different types of songs, all that knowledge built into them that 
when they went to write a song, they weren't even aware that they were just channeling something different, but that different was a con- like a collaboration of ideas that they had had from literally copying everyone else for the last couple of years. I call it the swagger jack. And ah. I believe it's the art of the swagger jack in life that will give you the ultimate unfair advantage. Mm-hmm. And, you know, over the years, uh, I think it was um, – I don't know. One of the jujitsu guys talked about in jujitsu, there's three different types of learning. You're learning from people that you're mentoring. So you're teaching them. So you come in, you're new. I'm teaching you the basics. I'm teaching you a rear naked choke. I'm teaching you, you know, the basics of a takedown, you know, and I'm learning because I'm teaching. And then you got people in the gym that you're competing with and you're, you know, basically at the same level, but you're pushing each other and trying to win and Mm -hmm. you're maybe giving each other little criticism or advice, but you're learning from each other. And then you got your people in the gym that beat the shit out of you that are your mentors that you learn as they explain things. And it's this like three-way cycle of teaching, competing, and um, getting mentorship that you really begin to master something. And that's why about seven years ago when I started coaching other people within my industry, we were like, what the fuck are you doing? Why, Mm. Why are you taking your time to coach other contractors? And... And it, and, and it was sort of uh, hypocritical at, at a time. But yeah. I <laughs> want, <me. laughs> I, I, I just, I, I had to figure out a way to, how to monetize my content. And the first person I could think of service was people that were just like me, mm-hmm. business owners and contracting. And, um, you know, first it started with coaching, but basically we do sort of a full suite of services and we help people build eight figure contracting businesses like clockwork and, you know, our marketing, our recruiting, and our sales system is like our business in a box. And I'm more like a person that licenses my business to other businesses. And now we're out there acquiring some of those businesses. Yeah. Because uh, Wall Street and private equity, they've turned their attention from um, a bunch of crazy tech stuff to they're looking at regular businesses like 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 roofing contracting companies, solar companies, home service businesses. Is, so – is the reason so you're saying that the venture capitalist companies, the big ones, it's, you said they're starting to look away from big tech and no, it's just you, that or? big tech has uh, been hit really hard and yep. basically is that because of the volatility as well? It's, with it's, it's, it's because such a of high multiple, so many things. But the reality is, is that when you have like in real estate, you got a real asset. When you have a home service business and you have consistent cash flow and you have a profitable group and a strong leader. Um, Like here in Naples, we were set up before the storm, and this storm just brings tons of opportunity, and it's like $100 million in business overnight. Yeah. And so, you know, what I'm looking to do is have these local businesses that are, you know, kind of the best markets and partner with people. Yeah. And um, I guess it's because when you roll up multiple home service companies, whether if you go public or not, it grows the value of the organization. But you know, at the highest level, once businesses get to where I'm at doing a hundred million a year, they're looking at our technology systems. They're looking at the different things that allow us to have that unfair advantage because it's a very competitive market. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people say in the past, like banks would never invest into contracting businesses. It was too risky, but like right now they're, uh, they're, they're throwing money at us. And if you can build an eight figure contracting business, you can build an eight figure net worth. Yeah. It seems like, I mean, I follow Cody Sanchez, not not sure if you're familiar with her, but she's definitely making the whole like invest in boring businesses mm-hmm. kind of trendy again. Mm-hmm. And by that, she just means like something that's like everyone wants to find the next Uber or find the next mm-hmm. Facebook. But she talks about looking for businesses to invest in that, you know, have a need, even laundromats, everyone thinks they're dead, but she goes, those can still turn around a good profit. Stuff like anything, basically anything blue collar would be considered boring under her books because she goes, there's a need, there's uh, tried and true uh, desires for people to leave these now. Sorry, there's people that are getting a little bit older Mm -hmm. because their kids don't want to take over it now Mm -hmm. and they've got nowhere to go. And so she's really starting to push, like, just invest in boring businesses if mm-hmm. you want to make money. Now, if yeah. you want the excitement, the flame, the fame, the glitz, the glamour, mm-hmm. go for the risky ones. Yeah, man. And I just think um, if you're a passive investor, you're into real estate, um, at my event, uh, I want to plug you into an opportunity to make passive money off my industry. Because mm-hmm. I believe that in 
servicing homes whenever you add a recession proof insurance element to it. Like Hurricane Inn dropped like $30 billion here in the state, but there's storms everywhere. The more houses that get built, you know, they talk about global warming, but the storms just damage more property. Mm. And um, so it's, it's like reoccurring revenue. And, yep. um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, trucking businesses that have scaled through crowdfunding and real estate businesses that have scaled through crowdfunding. And so I'm kind of trying to take over this like Chick-fil-A of roofing approach, but also mm-hmm. using crowdfunding and partnering with other strong people that are in my industry. Um, that's sort of like what we do. We coach people up and then we partner with them to take over the market. Gotcha. Um, so I'm interested as well, like, let's go back even before you got into roofing everything. Um, one of your things that interests, I mean, interests a lot of people was you, I didn't, Alexis told me about this, but you used to do stuff with Grant Cardone. Yeah. And I Googled that and I was like, oh shit, there's Lee. Yeah, that's how I got started <laughs> in the whole content game. I mean, I actually, before Grant, I, I was in Eminem's neighborhood and, and I trying to sell him a roof and I sold all of his in neighbors. Detroit? Roofs. Oh, you yeah, mean? In Detroit. I was really? chasing storms and I wrote this blog and you know, the truth is, it's like I've always tried to make my business cool and everybody's like, ah, oh, it's silly because my job was to get people into my business. But, you know, whenever um, this whole thing with Grant happened, it was about probably eight years ago, um, I was going through some tough times. Like my uncle, he was like the rich, more successful roofing contractor and I wanted to build a business like him. He passed away and it was sort of tragic and Basically, on the way to his funeral, I had his idea. I was going to sell Grant Cardone a roof. I've been a fan of him. I read a bunch of his books. He said he was a commercial real estate investor. So I thought, okay, he's got commercial real estate. Well, there's ways in which you can find people's data. I'm good at that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I found all of his properties. I ended up investing into some training. It takes money to make money. But especially if you want to do business with someone that's used to pay-for-play networking, you better be willing to pay. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, a year and a half later, end up re-roofing about 53 properties. And in the whole time period, I had to, like, start creating content and creating a university and start consulting because he was charging me nine grand a month. Mm. And I was like, damn, Jeez. just to keep up. Yeah. I better start selling some coaching and training. <laughs> and Scott Diamond's University was born. And it what was year like, was he, sorry? This is like 2000 and f- I don't know, 15, 16, something like that. Mm-hmm. But like I said, it's this, it's this me teaching my other roofers, me competing with people in my industry, me getting mentorship from people that were like more successful than me in the business, my uncle, some people around, their friends. But also I started hiring... Frank Kern, Russell Brunson, Ed Milet, Andy, Vers- all the coaches. I've spent millions of bucks and applied all their lessons. Yep. And that's really where it started to like <sighs> something was building like crazy. My business went from 10 million to 100 million bucks. You know, we created hundred millions of dollars worth of results for the people. A lot of it's through social media campaigns or advertising campaigns. So yep. we've gotten better kind of split testing all these different ads and uh, you know we sell an expensive product like solar business has really doubled profits and roofing and over the years i've been lucky because i followed the footsteps of grant i invested into multifamily property i flipped you know those multifamily properties into uh, more multifamily properties without paying you know a whole lot of like income tax and then mm. you know coming to naples uh, i got lucky and got in um on the water before things went through the roof And so roofing and real estate has helped me build my blue collar American dream. And even though I don't do the jobs, I sell them. That's sort of my purpose in life is to help people build character, confidence and freedom, tap into my industry. You can do it from home. You can do it on the phone. You can do it through Zoom. You can do it in person. You can do it from anywhere in the country. And so like I'm hoping to get sort of like regular people that are willing to get their own training system and tools and be like their own. Because it's not hard, honestly, to build a seven figure home service business because the ticket. It's $50,000 sometimes for every roof in South Florida, 50000 for every solar. Yeah. It doesn't take that many jobs. And um, so with solar, I think I saw a clip, maybe it was on your podcast. There was a guy talking about the benefits of solar coupled with roofing companies because of some sort of shit. Now I'm really Inflation Reduction it. Act. Infl- so that's everybody it. like wants to get crazy about the free money that came out in the Inflation Reduction Act. Billions, like $6 billion. Okay, Mm. well, the regular person can't tap into it unless they uh, get a free solar evaluation. And solar makes sense in Florida especially because, of course, we get a lot of sun. There's a lot of usage of the electricity with the air conditioners. But uh, 
basically there's so many people down here driving electric cars. There's so many people putting pressure on the grid that the power companies, they can't create enough power. They need more power. And basically whenever you put solar panels on your roof, you sell the excess power back to them. Mm -hmm. And it's called net metering. And it's something where my company's partnered with the state, but we can kind of offset their bill, kind of basically um, do a bill swap where that they have electric bill. It's sort of like FPL announces five-year price increases. Over over the next five years, they did $6 billion in infrastructure fixing um, all the power poles. They have had inflation due to gas prices going up. And basically Biden and all the people in office are making it so that, you know, solar, um, there's two ways that you can push people. You can make things more expensive and you can incentivize them. So mm-hmm. the 30% tax incentive for solar covers 30% of the cost. But if you do a roof with it, you get 30% off the roof and solar. Even uh, if okay. there's an insurance claim, even if your home was damaged by a storm, you got a roof paid for by the insurance. And then you get solar panels on there. The way it usually works is let's say you have a $200 electric bill. We can usually get you in for a little bit less for a solar and then you'll have a fixed monthly payment. Your bill won't go up above the amount ever and you'll be able to pay off your home faster and eventually own your own power and have um, Mm. no power bill. And so is there, because Australia used to do that where it was if you put more into the system than you were using, they stopped. stopped. Yeah, and this is what people have to understand. That's what happens when you have 10 to 15% market adoption. The power companies shut it down. Yeah. (laughs) They they don't get that here. So people are, don't realize that in a few years they may not have the option to go solar. Yeah. And, but yeah, you're right. So So they do it initially to incentivize people to get it to get it, build the system where, well, they're also building solar panel fields and they're going to create solar energy and sell it back to you, even though that you can create your own solar energy because it's the cheapest way to create power. The problem with solar energy is not a great way to store power. So Mm. if you can't sell it back to the grid, storing the power gets very expensive. Um, if you want to like, not have to worry about a storm, not have to worry about losing power. You just get batteries. And then there's yeah. Inflation Reduction Act will cover 30% of that as well. But selling solar is really cool because you don't have to sell it to anyone that you don't save a shitload of money to. And basically, there's a lot of people that give solar a bad name. So if you're just honest with people, it sells itself. And there's a lot of opportunity. Um, yeah. You can you can refer deals. You can refer people and and make, you know, 1000 to $2,000 per referral. You mm. can... You can you can close deals and and you can make you know seven thousand or more per deal, and um, of course the reality is is that, um, like you said, one day they're going to get locked out and they're not going to be able to go solar. So if yeah. you're the one to help them not miss out, then it's great. Yeah, that's the thing I've never understood about the whole like cities that need electricity, particularly like. Somewhere like New York, Mm -hmm. there's so much dead roof space. There's a couple of helipads, but other than that, it's just dead roof space. Florida's the same. A lot of dead, unused roof space that why not turn those into effectively sunflowers and just draw a... um, It's happening all across the country, and um, it's it's a gold rush. There's a a, a wealth redistribution happening right now. And Mm -hmm. basically, the cool thing about it is everybody's got a power bill. And right now, during recession... This is an opportunity if you're a W two worker to get a very large check back tax season time, mm. and this is a lot of people incentivized to save money and get a big check. So, um, you know, the thing is, is like roofing and solar makes sense when it's together. Sometimes individually, you can go wrong when you have one of these solar sales guys knocking on your door trying to sell you solar. Mm-hmm. But you know, I grew up in a roofing business, and um, you know, for me, what, stood- what are the issues if you just Guess getting solar on its own? Well, for one, the roof is pretty important. The warranty, the holes that you put in the roof, the fact that the roof needs to be, you know, warrantied along with the panels. Mm -hmm. Um, For two, a lot of it has to do with, like, the practices. Like, there's some dishonesty in the solar business. You know, the way that the tax credits work. You're not going to get all the tax credits back in year one unless you actually pay that much money in taxes. And there's a lot of manipulation where, you know, somebody will tell you whatever they need to get the deal, but yet, Let's say you are in Florida, you are 65, 70 years old, you're living on, you know, your social security, you're not paying taxes. Well, you shouldn't be taking out a loan for solar, probably. You should probably, you know, lease your panels. Mm. There's those options. But someone would 
maybe guide you in the wrong direction and incentivize you by saying you might get this tax credit, but you're not even paying taxes. So you're not yeah. going to get the tax credit. So there's a lot of that stuff that goes on. So what's leasing a solar panel, solar panels? It's where basically um, I will go out there and install the solar panels on my dime and then... On your roof. On, like a, your yeah. dime, my roof. Yes. And essentially um, you will just lease your roof to the power company and mm. and, and you, you, you will pay. Interesting. Yeah. And what would a typical leasing... Uh, solar contract look like? It would look like um, a 25-year 100% offset. We wouldn't do it usually if we don't get 100% offset. So, And what's that? Typically, we're able to offset 100% of the power that you use and then um, ha have your panel lease payment be less than your current power bill. Mm -hmm. And if we can do that, as your bill increase, you're just going to save more money, but you're saving money right now. Yeah. Plus, you're making the world a better place. Plus, you're tapping into some of these things. Got you. And what's in it for you in that transaction? You're getting a cheaper electric bill payment. You are potentially putting batteries on your house and off the grid in case you are off the grid for solar. Whenever, mm -hmm. whenever there's um, a storm, you got power when there's when there's a storm. If you go through Cape Coral, the solar systems they stayed on the roofs. They protected the roofs. They were very very solid in 120, 140 mile an hour winds. So. Um, what about the people that um, you're leasing to? What's their benefit? Because it's on their dime. So what would their, their so benefit be? The power company is going to get all the power and the excess power that you create because, like I said, mm -hmm. the grid, I mean, it's under massive pressure and there's more people using power than the, than the energy can create. Gotcha. Okay. So it's like a almost like a revenue share thing in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Without the down payment. Yeah. We call it the redirect. We're just going to redirect your power payment. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's always going to be more economical or it doesn't make sense. We don't sell you solar if it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and so what would – outside, like, um, back to the, the Grant Cardone stuff, how did you end up – because everyone loves to know how someone can okay, achieve so, that. So like, first of all, I spent 100000 plus check. Yeah, big investment. For, for two um, – I, when you get into a mentor program, be a great example of that guy's shit and tell everybody about it and mm -hmm. they will love you forever. So I told all the roofing contractors how he had helped me and then he got a lot of business from a lot of roofing contractors. Mm. So he was tied to me, man. He was like, man, this is the golden boy here. He closed me on some roofs. He's built the company here. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. And the thing is, is I got into a space. I'm a consultant. Now I get a little competitive. Uh -huh. uh, so it's fun. You know, he's like going in the ring with Muhammad Ali in negotiation. He's an animal. You'll never get, you'll never get over on him in a deal. He's always going to get the better end of the deal. But it still learned a lot and was great for me and a multi-million dollar project. So, you know, uh, kudos to the whole team over there for the growth. Because when at that time, he probably had a net worth of 20 to $30 million. Now mm -hmm. he's got a net worth that's closer to a billion dollars. And I've seen how he's done it through crowdfunding, through social media, through selling uh, coaching and reoccurring revenue, high ticket items, building a sales team. I've seen all these things. So it's like, how did I do it? Well, I made him an offer he can't refuse. It's like the Godfather. <laughs> and I said, if I can get your insurance to pay for your roofs, can I be your roofer? And you got these old roofs, and if you don't get them paid for, you're going to have to pay for it. And he's like, you mean this is going to cost me a million dollars if you don't do this and get it paid? And I'm like, that's what it's going to cost you. He's like, yeah, make this not cost me a million dollars. And so... It was pretty easy sell, and that's what makes like insurance claims roof replacement really cool. It's creative funding in a recession. It's funding from an insurance claim. And these people are the ones that are behind the ruling class rules. They're behind the bank bailouts. You know who wasn't failing? Life insurance companies. And mm. you see, because you know most people don't collect life insurance benefits. Yeah. Is it true that um, the insurance companies after Hurricane Ian, have, they put through – Originally, before, if you were forced to sue your insurance company, they would have to pay the lawyer fees, mm -hmm. which is typically 30%. Mm -hmm. I heard that 
uh, post Hurricane Ian, a new law went past where now it's no, you have to pay. Yeah, and what's funny about this new law is that DeSantis is out there publicly saying it's good for property owners, it's good for policyholders, it's terrible for any homeowner in the state of Florida. And DeSantis was bought by the insurance backed lobby. Mm. And so it's pretty simple. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. They, like they, if you have to sue your in- insurance company to get what they are meant to pay you. You shouldn't have to pay. No, there your used to be bad faith penalties where we could have double or triple the fines. There used to be uh, a way in which that the lawyers' fees were covered by the insurance company when they played these bad faith rules. And yeah. now uh, you have to pay for your attorney. Now there is no bad faith penalties. And these rules set up a, an environment that protected homeowners. And mm. let me explain to you in Irma. 80 to 90% of the tile roofs that we did, the insurance company denied or wrongfully said that the roofs needed to be repaired. Yeah. And these roofs were very badly damaged, leaking, and anyone that is in Naples will tell you about their experience. About 80 to 90% of them have to take them through the legal process just to get the roofs approved, Mm. just to get what they're owed. Well, now our success rate in the legal process after these new laws, it's going to be different. And luckily, this is the last time Hurricane in for people to – be protected because this was happened. This law was passed post Hurricane in, mm-hmm. and so they can't retribute. They can't go back and take away rights from property owners. But the thing is, is like DeSantis's net worth before he became our governor. You know, he was worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. He's a career politician. I mean, mm-hmm. he worked uh, basically as a jag attorney, and he did a lot of things. And God served our country, and he's a good American. You know, he's for a lot of things that I'm a believe in. But when it comes to the insurance market in Florida, there's a lot of socialist elements. Mm. Um, there's a state-backed insurance company. The state profits off of everybody. You know, you wouldn't think that every human in Florida who has to has insurance, they overnight got their rates doubled. Yeah. And, you know, there's not supposed to be monopolies in, you know, the world, and we're not supposed to have government-run companies. That sounds like communism, mm. doesn't it? Yeah. Well, that's called Citizens Insurance of Florida. And those are the same people that write checks to DeSantis and to this guy Jimmy Patronis to make mm. sure that these laws get passed. And you know who's to blame? You know who they say is to blame? Mm-hmm. Roofers knocking on people's doors, mm-hmm. educating them about insurance claims. They tried to pass a law that said that we couldn't say the word insurance claim and roofing in an ad, and it lasted 13 days. It was an unconstitutional law. One of my students sued the state and then had it overturned, and now they don't prosecute or enforce because it was a law that Jimmy Patronus and and that uh, um, Mr. Ron DeSantis signed off on for the insurance lobby that would have made it even worse for property owners. Because you know what the yeah. do you know what the big the big thing is the big the big lie. Mm-mm. It's that every roof or every property in Florida that's over 10 years old, 15 years old, it's probably been through 60 mile an hour, 70 mile an hour winds. It's probably had some bit of severe weather to it. And so there's a good chance with all the hurricanes that we've had that there could be roof damage enough to qualify for full replacement. Your insurance company knows it, but a lot of time the property owner doesn't. Mm. So oh. what they what they do is they pass laws that say we can drop you if you have an old roof and of course DeSantis signed that law as well but like I said you know when you're a career politician you get into business you're worth hundreds of thousands now I'm sure he's worth maybe a lot more <laughs> mm. maybe worth millions like most of the politicians yeah they make a lot of money somehow they we do. don't know yeah and then you <laughs> take the other side of the fence and you're not like Mr. Trump who creates more divide in the country than anything else almost yeah yeah I don't want him back in but um it is kind of weird with insurance companies that if I am a customer and I'm paying for a certain level of coverage, if I choose not to pay up to a point, fair enough, I chose that as a customer. <clears throat> but if we had an agreement that you will cover me for blank and now I'm not even allowed to exercise that, it's not even a right, it's a agreement. It's, you know, like outside yeah. of rights, it's like, no, you and I – Mr. Insurance. It's a contract. It's a I breach, made a contract. It's a breach of contract. And, and that's they're what trying happens. to protect themselves so like, no, we can legally breach our contract. But if also if you never use us, well, we win. Like, fuck you guys. Yeah. It's kind of weird. It's not weird at all. It's called m- the trillionaires of the world have a lot of practice at protecting their income and their class. Mm-hmm. And they make a different set of rules. Isn't that where we need a little bit of socialism? Just a little bit because yeah. like we need some 
government body to step in and do what's right. Well, you know like, what? You got a little bit of socialism and a little bit of capitalism in this Florida insurance market. So you might say... Because mm. that yeah. feels more like a capitalistic move. Like, well, fuck you guys. Well, listen, the socialist thing. I'm not, I'm not pro-socialism, don't you worry. Yeah. But <laughs> you get what I mean. Like, yeah, what what I what I you know the argument is is that all these technologies are going to start wiping out these jobs. You said have, have cars that can drive themselves. Look how many people might lose a job that is mm. now a taxi driver. Of course, there is a complete shift where now uh, working with your hands in the trades may be a way to save the American dream. Hopefully, I saw a video Reese actually literally before this. Josiah, have you got a USB C to USB? I might actually show Lee a video of this. I do not actually know. Fuck. I really want to show this video that came up. Uh, it's terrifying. Mm -hmm. uh, you know Alex from T Clinics. You mm -hmm. know guys. Okay, I'm going to show you this anyway, and we're just going to have like people are going to have to listen to it. Um, I have a feeling we're in we're in, in a uh, a bad state right now with uh, in terms of robots. Mm -hmm. Robots are getting too good. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to put this up in post, guys. So you guys can have a look at this. Jesus, I messaged too many people. So for people listening to this, what it is, is it is those new robots that they're all designing. You see them doing backflips. You see them doing some crazy shit. These are manning guns. And they are very good at shooting, target practice, taking orders, doing warning shots at people's ankles. And then... Damn, this is a special force machine. Uh-huh. It so it stops. It, there's one video, I don't know, you've already gone past it, but there was there's one video where they have two identical looking people. One is a doll, one is a human. Like this guy has, it's this guy, this robot has live rounds in its gun. There's a guy there standing there with a thing over his face, a, a, a bag, black bag over his face, same as the doll hoping that this shoots the doll in the face, not him. That's These some, dudes are psychopaths. No, that's, it's crazy looking. And the truth <sighs> is is that, you know, once there is all these uh, disparities that are just completely, you know, kind of made worse by this massive rise of technology, I mean, mm. people are going to have to form some sort of dependence on some sort of... Something concerning, because also in New York, they've announced that they're going to uh, in the in the tunnels they're going to release a those robo dogs. Robo dogs, which is <laughs> well. See, the thing is, is if the guys like uh, Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg are the ones that are controlling the white collar machines, and the investors behind the scenes are controlling them, mm -hmm. that's the scariest part about it. Because you know they've always held all the control of power, but now they can see into everyone's lives they can hear and manipulate and twist and distract and you just see the humanity like everybody's overweight everybody's depressed people are mm -hmm. killing themselves there's more people ad addicted to drugs and overdosing and it's just like uh whatever they can do to suck more profit out of us but you know to fight back you know you got to figure out like how to find confidence yeah you know for me as a man like Making money is an important part of that. Mm. And that's like Wes actually, Wes Watson did a video. It came out, I saw it yesterday. I mean, his thing was, it was about why he doesn't do drugs. He's just like, I don't have time, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that was what helped him at least. He's like, the busier I got, the less I could do stuff that was detrimental to my health. And um, I think though too, people, the majority of people- He's, talk, he's talking about meth. Yeah. Well, I mean, shit, that's a hair of the hell of a drug. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, who has time to be strung out on meth? Or, uh, isn't or, Adderall the same? I mean, it's not, just not as strong. No, Adderall's not the same. Okay. <laughs> Adderall is Adderall not. Adderall just the same. makes me laugh because so many people are pro it. And I'm like, well, I, I'm not that dude. I'm yeah, a pussy. Yeah. But, you know, like, here's my opinion on Adderall super ADD. And I will never go get a prescription to Adderall. But if you don't think that you could write more shit and get more shit done <laughs> on Adderall than not, yeah, there's no doubt about it. Well, yeah, it's an amphetamine. Yeah, but you and can do that with meth too. If, if you took meth like responsibly, like a responsible adult, yeah, but nice little dose. I mean, the thing is, is just that little at least the FDA has approved 
how it was made. I mean, the truth is about street drugs, period. Mm. They also approved the opioid. Um, well, I'm not. Da- I'm, hey, look, I, I'm not. I, I agree. That's fucked up. But Adderall, but Adderall serves your purpose. <laughs> can serve can make you can make you some money. Okay, <laughs> I, I don't have a prescription Adderall and I don't abuse it. But every once in a while, I'll get behind and I'll be like, okay, today mm. is the day I need to get focused. So what is it about? So I mean, I've never done it. Um, I got offered to do it the other, like a couple of weeks ago, and I was just like. One, there's no need just at the moment. Mm-hmm. But I mean, people like Dave Portnoy, they take it. Now, this is not an advertisement for Adderall, guys. I'm just, you know, I. Oh, we're going to go it. down this road. This is going to be fun. No, because it intrigues me in terms we're gonna, of. We're going to have a lot of conversations then. Yeah, it seems like a lot of people, a lot of successful people take it. And like before Adderall was a thing, mm-hmm. I used to hear about successful bankers taking meth. Well, it's fucked up, okay? Basically, you know, the way Hitler ran his army was he gave them meth and he gave them mushrooms. Did you mm-hmm. know that? He I gave, knew the meth part, not yeah, the mushroom part. Yeah, the meth would get them all fucking... Dur, 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 but the thing is, is like the mushrooms would actually like... Uh, whenever you're coming down and you have terrible like come down effects, this w- would actually kind of rebuild and re... He had, Anyway, so point mm. is, it's fucked up, but truth is, it's like... I thought mushrooms meant to make you like love everything. I mean, no. The psilocybin of it. The, the, the truth is, is that all the mushrooms are a bit different. <laughs> <laughs> it's all based off of your state of mind going into the trip. Uh, okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't do any drugs. I do smoke weed and take mushrooms. <laughs> 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 and might pop an Adderall every once in a while. <laughs> so what is it? So the focus, um, it, what is it? Just like it, it puts blinders on and it like takes away the distractions? What no, is I mean, it? I would say like for an ADD person, even sometimes when I smoke weed, I can get dialed in and focused and m- get my head moving in one direction. For mm-hmm. some people, they would say, oh, my God, it's a foggy thing. There's no way I could do that. Mm-hmm. Um, with ADD, I don't know. I mean, when it comes down to it, there's no such thing as being able to have like uh, your focus on multiple things at once. So it's about just like getting into that flow state about the one thing that just obsesses you. So, you know, I don't know. I would say like each thing has its own, like being positive and being in the right state of mind and being in belief, I think is important. And you can work towards that, get that in motivation, self-talk and affirmation that self to you lift and get that to you you know but then you also can fucking smoke a joint (laughs) and i mean (laughs) i mean it's the truth i mean you can do both yeah um you know i'm not wes watson um wes you know i I, he seems like he's on meth though well i know he's not he's not he's just that's what people say about me but i've had three different of my students die from drug overdose. Some of them, mm. one of them went to Mexico. He wasn't a drug user, too bad, but he's partying. He gets some cocaine. They got cocaine's got fentanyl. He dies. But it's like, man, at this point, street drugs, you're going to snort something, put up your nose. It could have fentanyl. Yeah. You're fucking crazy. Yeah. I mean, period. And uh, yeah, that fentanyl thing is terrifying. Yeah, it is. And, you know, people just recreational people just fucking falling over. Like for me, um, you know, kids, you know, like there, there is, if you want to keep partying and have some more drinks and have the conversation, just, just, you know, and then the thing is, is the moderation That's what my dad used to always mm. tell me, you know, like, uh, they give these Adderalls are 30 milligrams, dude. And some people they'll, they'll take two a day, you know, that's what the doctor says. But for me, <laughs> take a quarter of one, it's like four espresso shit oh really but that's really what i would have to say is, is it like, like a head high not a high but you know what i mean or is it like a bodily thing too like like if i have caffeine i don't really have a head high i feel anxiety in my chest no what do you like i would s- all? i would say it's just something that would help you edit really fast get your content out of your head better finish your thoughts more effectively once you're done with something, it would create anxiety for you to get to the next task. Mm, I already have that anxiety though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It just it puts it on the like it's super 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 Saiyan powers. Interesting. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah. It's not a bad. I mean, it, it's not good for you, and it's certainly not good to have as a prescription for you. And for mm. s- for a skinny guy like me who's trying to like lift and and get bigger and keep size on, it's not mm. good because you lose your appetite. And it, dehy- uh, it dehydrates you. It's not good for you. It's fucking bad for you. Do you, you have H G H? 
Uh, no, I don't have HGH. That could help. Yeah. Yeah, cool. I, I, I put, had uh, CJC1295 with the pomerelin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do that, but that's a peptide. That's where you. That's peptide, That's yeah. where your body I call it HGH it. just because yeah. I know it's not exogenous. No, but, I, no, but I, <laughs> I am on the superhuman protocols. Uh, good, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I got on it um, recently, and I put on like eight pounds of muscle in like two weeks. It yeah, was it's, just it's it's wild. a cheat code. So yeah, it re- put me. Yeah, it's it's cheat code. Yeah, peptides are good. Yes, guys, take them. Yeah, from po- from good people. Go to T yeah. clinics. <laughs> Absolutely. Um. So, with actually another thing too, which is interesting, most successful dudes I find in America, ninety nine percent of them don't have the loyal wife. Like yeah. they'll have the second or the third. Yeah. How do you do it? Well, my grandpa told me there's three great equalizers of of men, of great men. It's like drugs and alcohol, like abuse of them, mm-hmm. like uh, abuse and greed of money, like uh, stealing from people, taking money that's not yours, being a piece of shit. And then, um, you know, just being addicted to sex and just willing to fuck up relationships just because there's something better right in front of your face. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know what? Here's the thing about my wife. My wife is my business partner, my best friend, and she's been with me ride or die from the beginning. Yeah. I'm one of those, like, loyalist ride or die people. And I've had, as a businessman, a lot of people stab me in the back, in the front, in the face, in the ear, in the nose. And so since I got this one person that is ride or die Mm -hmm. that has never done that to me, there's no way I would do that to her. And so – I'm not the best at being romantic or being, you know, as thoughtful as I need to be. But, you know, I have a lot of fun on vacations with my wife. I'm a good dad and we we have a great life together. So I I think a lot of people um, try to like ask themselves this question, like what if there's something better and yeah. what if I'm settling and what's this, what if, what if, what if, what if. And, you know, me and my wife, we were dating for – Four months, we got pregnant, and then I asked her to marry me, and I just went with it. I mean, I was all in, and we've been married for um, 13 years. Mm-hmm. And so, like, now, like, this today, she's like, I don't want to be doing everything in the business. I'm <laughs> taking a step back. But she rebuilt our home. She's been, like, the general contractor. We flooded out, and we're on the water here in Royal Harbor, and she's been, like, like, key leader in helping our company scale from 10 to 100 million and you know the reality is is like um you know we still get to have a good time so like i wouldn't trade that for the world and you know i know a lot of men you know they think um you know there could be something better and i I, i'm lucky i'm blessed Mm -hmm. um she's like keeping me on my toes and i think it's just about having that other person that balances you out you know um but uh here recently just you know, she's been doing these uh, 5 a.m. burn boot camps. They got this uh, cult going on over there. 5 a.m., yeah, nah. I'm a sleep until 7 kind of guy now. There you go. Yeah. Th- it's interesting that you say, uh, like, your business partners because the one thing that I do seem to see, at least at what I'm noticing, and um, there's plenty of other examples outside of that, I'm, I'm sure, the ones that really, like, the relationships that really last, mm-hmm. there's an, still an element of business with them. Mm-hmm. Which is an interesting thing. Like, if I think of Alex Hormozzi, Ryan Pineda, the, like the figureheads that I see, uh, even one of my um, clients, actually two of my clients, there's they're so devout. You you don't, you don't get like that. You don't get even get like a, a like halfway. Ten, like we have our own accounts, or I handle this and you don't handle it, that. Yeah. Well, it's not even just like like there's what the ones that don't even have like that indication of oh they could sway. Mm-hmm are the ones where it's like, yeah, we also build our life on a financial basis together as well. Well, Like it's a good example is Grant and his wife. When I sold him a roof, she was sitting in his office and she hadn't built the personal brand for herself at the the time. So literally she wasn't his secretary. She didn't run his businesses, but she was around. Yeah, She was seeing the whole thing and and being around and being in his office. I think what happened was, is that she found her own path and she makes him a lot more tolerable. (laughs) <laughs> um, she is awesome, you yeah. know, and basically, uh, my wife loves her, read her book. Um, you know, I think she's great, but basically, uh, she has her own like following her own social media, but she f- supports the business, but she's not running the business. And I, yep. and I think, you know, the thing is, is like when, when you're on the same team, like she, 
we've today's social media is important, but Desiree's had a lot to do with the man that people and Wes Watson talks about, dude, you can't be a person of influence until you become that person worth having the influence. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so, um, you know, over, like I said, I, as a business person, young business person, I traveled and chased a bunch of storms and I would go different places. I'd meet people. I had different girlfriends. I had people that didn't have my back. I wasn't wool. But then whenever I got to this desperation point, I was like, I want that ride or die and I'll do whatever it takes and I won't mess it up when I get it. So when I got it, it's like, okay, um, I'll fight for my right to party here. Mm-hmm. What, what are we going to do? And um, there's been a lot of stressful situations. I think our relationships under uh, big changes in life is very tough. I think if you're ever having a tough fight with your um, significant other, look and see if there's major things going on in your life. And you can usually point and say, like, these were the toughest moments. But yeah. those times are seasons. They pass. And, um, you know, like, as far as, like, business and pleasure and how do you mix it, uh, you don't. Like she goes back and forth. It's like sometimes she's all in at the house, sometimes she's all in at the business, and she's she's able to kind of do what she wants. Um, I think um, it's my job though. Uh, there is a lot of consequence because sometimes she's the enforcer. Sometimes that role when it takes a toll on on the person that is is constantly the one dealing with the uh, the hard accountability stuff. I've recently become a parent. It's interesting to watch them grow and watch them just become a human being. And one thing that I really have learned from my little Sienna, kids will do what you do. They do not do what you say. That has really resonated recently with me. I need to be an example to my daughter and whoever, whatever future kids I have with my health, my fitness, making sure that I can be around to live longer. But not only that, I want to make sure that she has an amazing longer life. She has healthy values built into her. And those values come back to me. I'm the one that's responsible to put on to her. This has been a thing that we've been focusing with the easy challenge for parents. I know being a parent is very little time you can do. So finding hours and hours to go to the gym, finding time to meal prep everything, it's just, it's too much when you're a parent. So with this, we developed the one-two compound method. And this has helped parents lose up to 20 pounds in the first month. And some have even lost more than that leading into the second month and beyond. So if you're a parent and you want to figure out, you know what, I want to be around, I want to be more present with my kid physically and more active, being able to keep up with them, being able to instill more values of health so that they can not only have a better life, but also live longer because, you know, healthy life, longer life. Hey. So to find out more about this, just go to my Instagram. It is Aussie Blake Doyle. Now that is O-Z Blake Doyle. And then just slide in my DMs and write the word easy, or you can write more than that if you want, and I'll send you some information to find out how easy this easy challenge is. Now let's go back to the show. So, you know, I'm in, I'm, I'm in a different season now where I'm, I'm replacing her in that role. She's, she's, her nickname is The Warden because she'll send you to the, to the, to the death penalty. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mess with her, huh? Don't miss Mrs. Hate. Yeah, she's like five foot tall and really mean. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> she's not. She's sweet. That's funny. Um, so I'm actually going to take a completely random tangent because of our phone call we had yesterday. You were, What happened with this thing to do with what you call it? Um, some alien thing shot down? Oh, yeah, man. This is... Uh, you were on the phone, like, just for content for everyone. I was like, all right, see you, Lee. And then all of a sudden, he's like, holy shit. And I'm no, like, what's going on? <laughs> two things that were cool on the internet yesterday. One, Elon Musk was, Elon Musk was putting this huge sh- spaceship into the uh, stratosphere, and it exploded halfway into the, into the realm. And it's like, dude, biggest spaceship ever about to get launched is... Boop, gone exploded gone. 100 million plus i don't know how much he lost but the funny thing is is that it's not the first time for elon he's blown up plenty of those in the past and so did nasa though like they all yeah, that it's dude. a trial and error thing and, and you know what's cool about it is if you read his story like uh there was a time where his entire net worth his entire fortune everything was based off of um, one of the launches going good. And if it didn't go good, the funding for the whole thing was going to go down. And people think, you know, Elon's a genius. But if you, you know, back then, if it would have blown up then, he'd have looked like a big fool, you yeah. know? So part of what we do is we we have these ideas. We the, the world moves for a man on a mission that demands it. And then you just seem to get lucky. But it's funny because it's just, it seems like a bunch of good luck. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I remember well, there was a post by Elon and he said something like, I just need you all to believe I can do it. Yeah. Like something like, he, like, not that I, I mean, I'm not a religious type, but I know that there's shit that I can't explain. Yeah. You know, like I, I'm, I'm not, I know I don't have answers if that makes sense. Like the pyramids. Yes. Oh, don't get me. I'll go down a rabbit hole with that thing. Yeah. But, you know, I think there's a lot of, I'm aware that I don't know 99.9999 recurring percent of anything. You know, and so that whole thing when people talk about manifestation, thinking of what I want, is there an element of shit that you can't explain happening that impacts the outcomes? I don't know. Just like when you see some people that they're losers their whole life and then something happens where they have like a near death experience, they almost lose something or, and all of a sudden it's like they're a completely different human and then they just kick 20,000 goals in a row and you're like, what just happened? It's interesting to see how something can shift so quickly in someone based on it starts with their belief and then all of a sudden maybe people start believing around. Now, I believe wholeheartedly in the law of attraction. I think people get it wrong because they don't know that faith without works is dead and that every time that you have an idea and you have belief but then you don't take the next right action, mm. that you discount your belief and you add negative anxiety. And I think that basically you anchor your your feelings, your, I mean, you anchor your thoughts with feelings. So whenever you're able to like give yourself goosebumps, you know, like you're driving down the road, you're pumped up a about goals you like fucking love your life and where it's going you're like man i'm doing fucking good it's great I take over the world you know it's like that type of moment you know um where when you can anchor those feelings with like um your vision boards and the other thing is is other championship moments like you know last year at my conference i did a fight and D dustin poyo was there and jocko was there and i won in front of them and i was like fucking didn't get beat thank you <laughs> and uh you know other times where you know you land a 10 million dollar project and you you know what it felt other close grant cardone or deliver a great speech in front of a group of people or give away 20 rolexes to your sales guys you 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 replay the, how that made you feel mm. and then you anchor it with your vision and you constantly, you 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 go into this place in your head where you're you're a monk that can see the future, and that you act like your future self experiences it. You give yourself the future feelings, and then you don't you don't be a bitch on your dreams. When the opportunity comes to do the fucking thing necessary, it's going to be challenging. The world's going to throw. The, I call it the law of natural resistance. So shit's going to keep coming at you, and you know it doesn't matter if it's a, like a video game or whatever, like. The harder the boss, the harder the level, the, the better the reward. Mm. And usually the closer that you, you know, the, the, the worse of destruction, like the day before I closed or got the opportunity to close Grant, I lost the biggest contract of my life. It was a $700,000 um, replacement roof. I had it on contract. There was no reason for me to get it canceled. This insurance company said that I was an out of state storm chasing scum and it was a it was a country club and they basically wanted to keep some of the money and they they used it as an excuse to cancel the contract and I thought woe is me feeling victim 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 and then this opportunity comes right through the pipeline so mm. You have to believe that when the door is closed on you, that you're just that much closer to your big championship moment. And that sounds like really like, but that's really to me how you make the world move for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, um, I, I like Alex Hormozzi's quote, which is it, your confidence comes from competence, yeah. not the other way around. We always want to just, we want to believe, like this, there's an element of you have to believe in yourself before you do it. But when you truly believe in yourself is when you know you can do it. Well, every because time you that you do something that aligns with your vision and goal, you reinstate your confidence in it. Now, you do have to be able to know what you want from the beginning. You, do, mm -hmm. you, you don't have to know exactly what you want, but it helps. It helps to know that you want to pay for a plane, a yacht, multifamily properties you want to build facilities you want to do all these different things you know it helps yeah would you say that most people today though because of the amounts of information and opportunities we have it's 
becoming the problem rather than the solution. No, I think the problem is is that we want immediate gratification and that we have all these different distractions and information and we get a little dopamine hit from it. We get a little hit just from learning. Mm-hmm. You get if you uh join the mastermind or watch the video, you get you get this like I did something. You didn't mm-hmm. do shit. Quit celebrating the first step, you know. Yeah, yeah ba- that's what I'm saying is like basically we yeah. Can- I think get that, that dopamine hit over and over again. Yeah, and if you got the smartest computers controlled by the richest people meant to just distract you and just to keep your attention as long as possible, if you do not know how to rise above it, this is being strong in in, in faith and fitness and as a man, then then you're gonna get sucked in. Mm-hmm. And I've seen it happen to young, old men, women. You know, and even me, like as a poster on social media, trying to grow your brand, you get sucked in by the algorithm. Mm. It's like, am I, am, am I getting, am I coming under the quicksand? <laughs> and so for somebody who's starting out anything, like, I mean, let's say roofing, solar, or they're working with someone, what's your advice for them to avoid the distractions? How would, how would you do it? For me, I got demons. I get up in the morning and I sweat. Um, I also, I know what I want, like the vision board. I know exactly what I want. Uh, I know my core values. Um, I'm true to my core values. Uh, I think you have to think about the people, like a lot of times we're the toughest on the people that are close to us. So how do you treat the people that you're close to and who are the five people that you spend the most time with? And then what's your cycle of learning? Do you have, uh, people that you're getting mentorship from, people that you're competing with, people that you're uh, mentoring. The level of each one of those will give you uh, good, healthy energy. Mm-hmm. The more people that you mentor, the more you compete. I mean, people say, don't compete. No. No, you gotta. Fucking, you got to compete. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't take this. I mean, you can... And I think this idea is like comparing yourself to others is going to make you depressed. Well, you know what? Some of that Mm. is fucking good. Sometimes you need to be depressed to say, I need to fucking create more content. I need to be a little bit more authentic. I need to fucking get my story out there. Sometimes these depressed moments have caused the biggest breakthroughs. Mm. So, I mean, you know, I just think that um, we live in a world where – people have been given participation trophies that we do have a bunch of entitled people that want to be given awards uh, that want all the like goods without the grunt work. Yeah. And, they, and, and, and listen, I think like it's always about finding the most revenue generating task. <laughs> so when I say grunt work, I mean it like, you know, start with, like if the most revenue generating task is work with your hands, start there and then learn a new skill. Like I love what Alex says about how the most important thing is that you learn the skills and, yeah. and um, that you learn skills that get you to the next level, like invest into your own skills. And that's, that's the one thing I've done. I, I had a lot taught to me. I grew up in a family business. I had good mentorship. I was privileged. My dad, his he was middle class though. His he was proud he could spend five times more money than he made. And he had a roofing company. It wasn't, you know, like, you know, he taught me a method of business. But taking it to the next step meant bringing people from outside and paying them mm-hmm. and millions of dollars over the last seven years. And um, you know, here recently, like even Wes, I was thinking, well, dude, I started in business way before you. I've got a hundred million dollar business. Why am I going to pay you for as a coach? Mm. Dude, he's got more social media, his organic, his ability to basically vibrate and and share his truth. And then he's got an $18 million coaching business. His coaching business is doing more than mine. Mm. And so it's like, dude, fuck it. Yeah. Here's my money. <laughs> yeah. So when you compare the specific of what he's better at, it's, it's more, it's more, that's a better thing to compare to rather than compare your whole organization of the roofing. No, you compare every... Well, that's why you I like to look at it like Pokemons, okay? Oh, I like this transition. All right. (laughs) So everybody's got their, like, skills on the back of the card, and everybody's Mm -hmm. got their innate, like, special powers, Mm -hmm. right? And so the goal is to read everybody's card, to learn all their games, and then to... Throw have a variation of their move in your in your in your uh, arsenal if mm. if it applies to your core values and your personality and you can have stories that align with it 
And so I believe like, um, you know, for me, like COVID came along, um, there was like riots outside my house. I was skinny fat. I didn't know as this virus was going around, if the body could be the mask or if I needed to go get a shot and I wasn't going to go get a shot. So I went Mm -hmm. to the gym, I committed to 75 heart. And then at the gym, I fell in love with boxing. And I'm like, okay, this is a midlife crisis. I woke up and choose violence. I woke up and choose violence. But the reality is, is like whether it was Jake Paul or Logan Paul, these kids, they add influence over me, showing how basically um, people are entertained by uh, just regular people and their journey through the fight game. And so that got me into the MMA deal. And now, like, uh, at my event this time around, the goal is to do an MMA fight and mm. to do it at the event. Gilbert Burns is going to be there. He's actually running oh. a jiu-jitsu seminar. Cosmo is going to be running a, a, a Muay Thai uh, seminar. Mm-hmm. If you never tried it before, come on down. And, like, you can just come for, like, the workout and the UFC autographs. So you don't have to get punched in the face. And where did you say it was again? It's at the Luminary Hotel. Luminary? It's September 1st through 3rd. The fight nights is how we kick off the party. It's like how like the goofy elbow drinking, like mm-hmm. like like, hey, how you doing? But but we do it like um with the twenty five thousand large jujitsu tournament, winner takes home twenty five K cash. And yeah, wow. Um, there's going to be uh bands, fights, and we're gonna kick off our fight for the American dream. Because I think to fight back against these fucking machines, to fight back against the people that are printing the money, to fight back against the banks. Like in, in the algorithms, you, you know, how, how do you, you got to, you got to win in fitness. You, you got to know like how, how to spend quiet time with yourself and be happy with yourself. Like mm. the meditation and the mindfulness for me, like you can talk about all the different most important things that you do. But if you can't drive down the road without the radio, if you can't go to sleep without being okay with yourself, I've been there before. Mm-hmm. I've not been able to quiet the mind, but you know, I I just believe that, you know, being in gratitude and having these like breathing exercises when things get tough that you can still, Grant says you have to be able to set yourself on fire, which means sometimes you have to pull yourself out of emotion, not let a low get too low, see it for what it is, and then get re-excited about the things in life that you love in in the face of adversity. And, and I'm just, I'm thinking like, you know, you, you say the boring businesses, that's why I got into creating content. Mm. That's why I reached out to Grant Cardone or, or, or started creating um, this, this social media movement was because I was a roofer for 15 years or 12 years, and I, I wanted something more. Yeah, and so it doesn't matter what you do, but you had built the foundation for that roofing thing before you before absolutely the, before you jumped I'd knocked the next on hundred thousand doors. I'd set yep. up kitchen tables in forty states. Yeah. I've 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 met all these people. When you go into someone's living room, just like here, you got to be a chameleon. Mm-hmm. You got to be able to have be a conversationalist. You gotta you gotta care. You gotta listen, and you end up you know, hearing about their values, hearing about their religions, hearing about their businesses, hearing their point of views, and you learn from everybody. And so I think it's a great way to learn how to be an entrepreneur going door to door. And so um, that's the foundation. Uh, But, you know, the truth is, like, Wes's first videos went so viral, like, it just, like, shits on Mm. the stuff that, like, I've put a whole body of work together thousands of it, you know, and then yeah. the guy, his story, he, he spent 10 years in prison. Yeah. And that was his background work to be in relevant. But the truth is, is like our oddities become our commodities, mm-hmm. you know? And for me, my oddities were, I've been a fuck up, you know, like I've been talking about right now. All right. Work hard, play harder. But yeah. I've got this down to as long as I pray, be in service, give back to my community, have a higher purpose to raise the status of the blue collar entrepreneur that my demons can be held in check. And, you know, I do some things for therapy to get rid of those demons like boxing and jujitsu and some of these different other things. But the reality is, you know, I've I've seen my, my uncle pass away from suicide. I've seen three of my students pass away from drug overdose and vibrating on a higher level is about survival. Mm -hmm. It's about, uh, not just survival, but also if I don't max out my potential and do everything I can, it's like the end of my lip. I, I didn't live my life. Yeah. And so, like, I don't know. Just document your journey. For me, it's like roofing. Who wants to hear about that? At first, I would tell myself that. And then I was how like. How the roof is. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then now it's like, you know, how is that relevant to everybody? And, yeah. And I'm basically 
like, you know what? The biggest thing is, is like at my next coming event, I want everybody in there. And it doesn't matter if you want to come for like the inspiration, like our guy, Nick uh, Santasano, he has one arm, but he speaks at all the Tony Robbins events, one of the best motivational speakers ever. I brought him in because I had a student and friend, a guy, a jujitsu teacher and a salesman. He got paralyzed this year. His name's Ben Kunzel. I saw that. And he's a champion. He's a world champion jiu-jitsu guy, but literally he was going to come to our event. I had him last year on the speaking, and he was paralyzed. And, and, and he's How did it happen? In jiu-jitsu. Mm-hmm. He was preparing for Worlds, and basically he was doing a fireman's carry, went to lift somebody up, and then they sprawled on his neck, and it's just a freak fucking accident. Ugh. But he went paralyzed, and it's from the neck down, and so it's a bad injury, and he's in a fight to ever walk again. But... The big thing is, is now he's helping me. He's booking my podcast. He's mm-hmm. my Dream 100 consultant. He's selling jobs virtually. And he's going to be speaking at the event about how this incident, even though he lost his legs and he was a roofing salesman, he was in jujitsu, has catapulted him into something that's a better life. Yeah. That he now has a bigger platform, that he can work from home, that he can basically sell roofs, solar, he sells real estate, but also make an impact in the community, do speaking. And it's just like when something like that happens, you know, for me, it's very tragic because. Mm. Does our, he have access to his arms to like he can use his arms? Or yeah. Is it yeah. Down? So he does like uh, wheelchair rugby. Oh, okay. So he's got his arms. Oh, that's what I was going to ask him. Like, yeah. how's he doing all this stuff if he's no, neck down? No, but... it's like, it's, it's <clears throat> right below the neck. Mm. So basically um, he, he's, he he has movement in his torso. He's he, his. It's just a high up, um, vert broken back. Okay. So I don't know exactly where it was, but yeah. I just know basically, um, he's in a journey and he's going to be the first ever to walk from his incident and mm, giving him an opportunity cool. to speak and having him uh, open up for our guy Nick. Dude, one thing about it is is he taught me like. Overnight, things can change. You better be willing to. I've never heard him complain. I know he's had tough days, but I always hear him in a good spirit. And he's talked himself through not only just like having a better life, but being being a much more like, I don't know, impactful person, mm-hmm. he, and he, even under li- more limited circumstances. And so, like, uh, we uh, we sponsored the ADCC. It was a big jujitsu tournament, and he went with us to the event. and he was selling at the event. It was cool, man. Yeah. That's awesome. And so, so let's, let's wrap this up. Cause that was, that's a fucking strong thing to end with. <laughs> yeah. Um, so people who want to get in touch with you, Lee, how do they find you? Uh, they can find me on Instagram, Lee underscore hate. They can find me on YouTube, Lee hate, you know, make sure that you follow along. The journey is going to be crazy. Mm-hmm. I want you to come to the blue collar conference. If you go to blue collar conference.com, uh, we'll, we'll help you tap into the blue collar American dream. Even if you're white collar, we'll have you flip your collar. And even if you're <laughs> an investor, put a marker on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll help you get into a, a passive investment opportunity. But if you're an entrepreneur, you want to come for the fights, come for the party, come for the show. Um, dude, we're about the American dream and Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Republican, Democrat, crat, white or black, like we all need more money and the gold rush is in America's home. So, um, in Fort Myers, uh, a year after the hurricane, we're going to have a big party and, uh, you're invited. If you're watching this, come on out. You can get your tickets at blue collar conference, the early bird special, 297 bucks. And uh, come on out, buddy. Yeah, set up the podcast. I'll set a. I'll put a, that link in the bio as well, guys. So if you you don't remember it, yeah, yeah, perfect. Well, thanks for coming on, dude. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. Great to finally meet you, and we'll definitely keep in touch for sure. I can tell. But guys, make sure to subscribe, and we'll see you next time with more cool people. Peace.